Has Been Hotel is a show that a lot of people have eagerly been awaiting for a long time. And when I say a long time, I mean, oh my god, has it really been 10 years? If you've been around my channel before, you might have seen my review for the original Has Been Hotel pilot, which aired back in October of 2019. But Has Been has been in development long before then. The first teaser animatic for that pilot came out in December of 2017, and even long before before that, Vivzipop had speed draws of the various Has Been Hotel characters on her channel. The oldest art currently on her YouTube channel of Angel Dust dating all the way back to September of 2013. Has Been has slowly but surely been working its way up from a couple of Tumblr drawings to a full-blown animated show. Like I said, I reviewed the pilot before and in that video I expressed how excited I was that the show had officially been been picked up by A24, the production company behind a ton of my favorite films, and I've been excited to see what the full show was going to be. However, in that long wait time, especially after the pilot aired, the production of Has Been Hotel has been marred with a storm of different controversies. First, it was announced that the original voice cast was going to be replaced. A lot of fans who deeply loved the original voices for these characters were very upset over this. Rather than let these indie voice actors ride the success of the show into its full professional production, they've seemingly been tossed to the wayside for the sake of star power. Then there was delays to the schedule with little to no advertising for the show, making fans feel lost in the dark as they were given no answers when it came to the show's production. Then there was allegations about animators being underpaid, there's been discussions about using voodoo symbols, and lots, lots, lots more. But at the center of it all, and in my opinion the biggest thing, is Vivzy Pop herself and her attitude in general. I'm gonna be honest. Viv seems chronically online, famously getting into huge Twitter arguments with random nobodies just because they say they don't like her cartoons, well known for blocking and ignoring any and all opinions towards the show that isn't overwhelming praise. Her behavior just doesn't feel very professional, you know? Throwing a fit on Twitter isn't really the behavior of a professional with a professionally made show, right? It never made sense to me. Your show is huge. It's massive. People adore your show so much. Everyone has seen these characters because the fan base of Has Been and Helva is so big and so dedicated. People love these shows so much and they've diligently sat around and waited for the years and years it's taken for the show to get made. Your fan base is so massive and loved your show so much and the show hadn't have even come out yet. Yet, rather than look at this gigantic Gigantic, adoring fan base you've made with this show, you are instead bothering yourself with randos who didn't like it? Throwing a pity party and waiting for your fans to fawn over you? Come on. Unlike Hell of a Boss, this isn't some indie project anymore. You're not dealing with YouTube animation status anymore. This is a professionally made product, with a professional company behind you and a whole cast of professional voice actors. You better start acting the part of a professional soon. Because Viv's temper tantrums and juvenile attitude is going to kill the show way faster than any schmuck like me making critiques of the product. In the five years since the original pilot came out, I've watched the hype for Has Been Hotel do more ups and downs than a drug addict. It's an uppers and downers joke. Is this how you do Has Been Hotel humor? Talking to anyone about Hell of a Boss and Has Been Hotel is very polarizing. On one hand, there's some really intense, toxic haters of the show who go so far out of their way to be abhorrent towards anyone who likes the show in any capacity. On the other hand, there's rabid Viv fans who act like any sort of complaint or critique is blasphemous towards their overlord, the goddess of swear jars. It's so bad on both sides that a part of me was afraid to even make this video. But 
fair is fair. If you're bothering to listen to me babble about my dumb thoughts and opinions for the show, it's only fair that you get to express your own thoughts and opinions in the comments too. Even if they're wildly different from what I have to say. Because this doesn't always have to be a battle of opinions. We can respectfully disagree with each other, can't we? My goal with this video isn't to ruin someone's perspective of Has Been Hotel. I just want to point out the parts that I think was done really well, and also talk about the parts that I think could be improved. Because, like I said when I reviewed the pilot, I do want to see the show succeed. I want to see it be better, and I'm intrigued by the world and characters. And hey, if you end up agreeing with some of my points, maybe give the video a like too. Share it around, tell your friends, it really does help out a ton. Well, this is going to be a long one, and there's no point in waiting around anymore. Let's dive into the world of Has Been Hotel. Welcome to hell, motherfucker! Let me give you a quick rundown of the plot, just in case you haven't seen the show or you need a refresher or something. Every year, the angels go to hell to kill a bunch of the residents to keep them from wanting to try an uprising. Charlie, the princess of hell, daughter of Lucifer and Lilith, want to find a way to redeem sinners so they can go to heaven, saving the citizens of hell from the annual executions. She starts the Has Been Hotel to house her wayward souls, working alongside her girlfriend Vaggy, Husk, their bartender, Nifty, their housekeeper, and Alistair, a very powerful demon who hangs around because he likes to watch people fail. Charlie tries to help a couple of sinners redeem themselves, including Angel Dust, the famous porn star, and Serpentius, who does his best. <laughs> the angels move up their next execution date to only six months, so the has -been Hotel patrons try to find a way to prove sinners can be redeemed and get heaven to call off the execution. But they're not able to convince them in time, however they do reveal the executions to the rest of the angels in heaven. Apparently only those in charge had been aware this was happening. Unable to stop Adam and his right hand loot, the has -been patrons figure out a way to kill the angels and go to war to drive off the threat, which they succeed in doing after killing Adam, though they suffered some losses, both with the hotel itself and with the death of Serpentius. The crew pick themselves back up and commit more than ever to rehabilitating sinners, rebuilding the hotel to be even bigger and better than before, and we find out that Serpentius ended up making it to heaven after he died in battle. So that's like the gist of the story, and if you feel like all of that might have been too much to cram into only eight episodes, well, you might be right. That's not even including the various subplots peppered throughout the season, introducing a trio of villains named the V's, Angel Dust dealing with sexual abuse, one of the Hell's overlords killing an angel in the first place, various old friends coming to visit or help with the fight, Charlie reconnecting with her dad. It's... A lot. An awful lot. And not a lot of time. Oh, but wait, there is another part of the story, though you can't find it airing alongside the rest of the episodes. About a wonderful, fantastic new hotel. Yeah, the pilot. You know, the YouTube animation that came out five years before the show actually aired, cobbled together by a bunch of different animators where every shot lasts only a few seconds and the line thickness changes every single time the camera cuts to a different angle because it's likely done by a different animator. The pilot! You know, on Vizzy Pop's own personal YouTube channel, so she personally gets all of the money from the monetization off of it. And don't you worry, there are in fact several different ad placements scattered throughout the middle of the episode. And it is 100% expected of you to have watched this pilot before you watch the show proper. It does not matter what it is. There should never be any point in time where someone has to watch any supplemental material to understand the story of a show. Steven Universe's pilot isn't necessary to watch to understand how the plotline plays out. Ruby's red trailer doesn't need to be watched to fully enjoy the show. Yes, those two examples are great and I love them. As a fan of their content, I would recommend people watch those things to get further enjoyment from the premises of their respective shows. But that's not the case here with Has Been Hotel. The show 100% acts like you've already watched the pilot on YouTube and doesn't bother addressing critically important pieces of characterization and lore. Or at least, 
it sort of does and sort of doesn't. Alistair gives us a brief rundown of his character in episode one, reminding us how he is only at the hotel because he likes to watch people fail. But if you've watched the pilot, this information isn't necessary. It's just a boring repeat of what we already know. It happens later too when Mimsy drops a bit of Alistair's backstory, but it's nothing different from what Vaggy already explained back in the pilot. So it seems like, on one hand, the show does recognize that not everyone has watched the pilot and would need to be caught up on this information. But also, on the other hand, they don't bother trying to explain other important aspects of it. Cherry Bomb shows up with no introduction, and it's clear we're just meant to remember her from the pilot, remember her personality, remember her relationship with Angel Dust, but it's never explored in the show proper. Same with Serpentius. If all that's true, you'd think I'd have heard of you. I attacked you literally last week. Yeah. In the pilot, he attacked. But if you just watched the show, you'd be like, who the fuck is this random snake dude? Why is he coming out of nowhere? Well, if it isn't my arch nemesis. Since when? We just got introduced to this chick. When was she your rival? Well, you gotta watch the pilot to understand. <gasps> Razzle, dazzle. <laughs> who and fucking who? Razzle and Dazzle are not in Hasbin Hotel. They're like barely in in one scene in like episode three or something. And then in episode five, Lucifer name drops them as if they've like existed substantially on screen at all before now. It is like you haven't been here all year long. Are we really? We've literally been here the whole time. Oh, but guess what? They are in the pilot. But even then they show up only during Charlie's song at the news station. So I 100% thought they worked there. I didn't think they were Charlie's personal attendants or whatever. Whatever. And even if I did think that, no one ever told me their names. Let's be real, they don't need to be in the show at all. They've added absolutely nothing, and even watching the stupid pilot doesn't tell me who they are. One of them dies in the finale, and I'm like, oh no, that random background goat character who I don't know which one is which, Oh no, they died. <laughs> the show has been public about its characters and ideas for a very long time, and it expects you to have kept up with all of the dumb extra supplemental material, all of Vivzy Pop's ugly old speed draws, all of the Tumblr posts, all of the Q&A podcasts or whatever. You can't just watch the show, you have to do homework. Yep, everyone's favorite thing. You're confused about who the hell these two worthless ass goat guys are. Make sure you catch up on your Vivzy Pop history chapters to understand. Oh look, it's Mimsy! Weren't you just on the edge of your seat waiting for everyone's favorite character Mimsy to finally show up? Yes, it's me! I know you were all waiting for me! Way back in the day, she was planned on being one of the main characters, along with some of these other incredibly hideously designed monstrosities. Jesus, this one actually hurts my eyes. Oh, ugh, what the hell? Just vomit. Ugh. <laughs> well, no, I wasn't waiting for Mimsy to show up because I didn't know about her existence. I'm not gonna go through 10 plus years worth of Vivzy Pop's old Tumblr post and ugly art videos just to understand basic information about the characters in this cartoon. The show tries to play it both ways, stopping to drop important backstory lore for characters that we would already know if we watched the pilot, but also straight up throwing a bunch of crap on screen without any explanation, expecting you to have engaged with everything Vivzy Pop has ever done. It's embarrassing at best and sloppy more often than not. What's worse is that the pilot also actively goes against the structured plot of the show proper. It's one thing for the pilot to have differences with the characters' designs or their voices, that's fine and understandable, but the pilot Pilot says that the execution happens every year because hell is overpopulated. This was changed for the show proper, and I think it was a detriment to the story in the long run. In the real show, the execution happens just because the angels want to continually show their might to the patrons of hell to stop them from trying an uprising. So if you want to understand the important character moments or story establishment, you gotta watch the pilot, cause it's not in the show. Oh, but some of the important establishment 
punishment does get talked about in the show. So you're just going to have to sit there and listen to a bunch of repeated information nearly word for word that you would already know if you watched the pilot. And some of this establishment isn't even true to the story proper anymore. Oopsie. That's all just a bit confusing, isn't it? It's almost like most professionally made shows don't count their pilot episodes, which was mainly just used to pitch the product to companies as a necessary watch for a reason. I think the worst part is that it kind of ruins this moment at the end of the season when Alistair asks Charlie to make a deal. The threat of Charlie making a deal with Alistair was first set up in the pilot, but never in the show proper. And you can tell they wanted to lean into the pilot's original themes of Charlie and Alistair potentially making a deal down the line, because it incorporates a lot of the same green lighting as each other. They both have important themes about shaking hands. Clearly, this is paralleling the pilot's scene. It's a really good full circle moment that ends up being payoff over nothing in the show proper. A Chekhov's gun without the gun. I'll keep it simple. If it's not in the show proper, then it doesn't count. Never expect your audience to engage with any supplemental material. Hands down, the biggest complaint I and many others have had about this season is the fact it feels too rushed. Understandable, given how much they've tried to tackle in only eight episodes. I've heard rumors that the original plan was that the first season would have 12 to 16 episodes or something like that. But you know, business is shit sometimes. Shows these days don't usually get more than eight episodes much, sometimes less. I'm not gonna act like I know exactly how the show ended up with eight episodes. There was likely a lot of meetings talking about budgets and expectations and other very exciting things. <laughs> but yeah, season one has eight episodes, so suddenly all of that plot needed to get crammed down into half the runtime it was originally planned to have. And you can kind of tell. I'm glad they managed to keep the important parts of the story, given how many different elements was necessary for all the different moving parts. Introducing that Carmilla figured out how to kill angels, teaching Vaggie about it, revealing Vaggie used to be an exorcist, Charlie talking to heaven, angel dust and Serpentius starting to redeem themselves, Charlie's relationship with Lucifer getting mended. A lot of things happened, and for the most part, they did a good job laying it all out there. But I won't lie, it all definitely would have hit a lot harder with the proper setup. A good amount of these emotional moments would have hit way more if we had gotten to spend more time with these characters. Like, let's use Charlie finding out Vaggie is an exorcist. This revelation is only revealed in episode 6, and in episode 7, we see Charlie being upset that Vaggie hadn't have told her about this, and we see her get over these issues all within that same episode. A lot of problems get introduced and resolved all in the same episodes as each other. Oh no, Serpentius is working for the V's and is infiltrating the hotel. Never mind, he's had a change of heart. Oh man, Charlie's relationship with Lucifer is bad. Never mind, they've immediately reconciled. Like I said, I think they did pretty good given their circumstances, but also I think they could have definitely cut some of the extra fat out to better develop our main cast even more. Let's be real, the V's was totally a waste of time. Mimsy was also a waste of time. We spent a huge chunk of screen time setting up Zestial, like he's going to be important, but he never was. Vivian is obsessed with all 500 of her OCs and insisted on keeping every single one center screen all the time. We waste a lot of screen time on these extra characters who, yes, will likely play bigger roles down the line, but as far as season one is concerned, they ended up being pointless. We have a huge elongated scene setting up Zestial as a character. He's the one who listens to Carmilla admit she killed the angel. This should have just been Alistair. The fact he secretly learns this information didn't change the outcome of the story. He needed to know the information to trick Charlie into making the deal with him. He could have just been the one standing in the room with Carmilla, further developing his character, further giving him something substantial to say and do. The fact that he learned this information secretly isn't ever really brought up. Vaggie shows up yelling about how she knows she killed an angel, but Carmilla doesn't seem 
seem surprised or angry or anything. By all means, she could have just told Alistair herself and it would have changed nothing. Velvet spends a whole song and dance talking about wanting to go to war with the angels. But when the war actually comes, she's sitting on the couch doing nothing. She doesn't even get lines of dialogue after this song wraps in episode three. And yeah, I like this song a lot, but let's be real, this screen time could have been used to further develop our real cast. The episode had Vaggie trying to teach the has-been patrons about trust, and we get this whole song where she doubts herself and wants to do the best for Charlie, but we barely even see them in this episode. We spend way more time on the overlords, so Vaggie's song kind of feels hollow once it starts up. Same with episode two. The majority of this episode is about the Vs, setting up all three of their characters, their jobs. We have a big ol' song about Vox's grudge with Alistair, and yeah, it sucks because I actually really like these characters. I love villains, and Vox and Velvet especially are a lot of fun to me. But looking at the actual season, they are not necessary. At least it wasn't necessary to spend so much screen time on them. The only one who had an important impact on this season was Valentino, since he's directly connected to Angel Dust and his personal development. It's fine if we want to start setting up characters now who will be bigger players in season two, but especially given how this season had only eight episodes, Viv seemed to have gotten her priorities mixed up. Because whenever the show focuses on our actual cast, those scenes are not only the most interesting, but also the most entertaining. These characters actually bounce off of each other in really fun ways. The core cast is already so good, and I love it when they just get to hang out and talk to each other, but they hardly ever get to because the camera keeps dragging itself over to other superfluous characters. I think we should have spent way more time with Cherry Bomb and Serpentius. I don't really care that he died in episode 8 because he's barely on screen. Even after he joins the hotel, he's just kind of there in the background. As for Cherry Bomb, she joins the final battle and is clearly one of Angel's closest friends who isn't in the hotel. I wish she could have been established sooner than the third to last episode of the whole season. On the bright side, since season one already spent all of this screen time setting up all these random side characters, hopefully this means season two can dive right into the substantial stuff without needing to slow down to introduce us to all these other characters. But also, I'm kind of worried season two will introduce even more characters. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> I wasn't really surprised when Hasbun Hotel deviated from how Bible characters are usually depicted. After all, Vivzy Pop is the person who took Beelzebub, Deadly Sin of Gluttony, Lord of the Flies, often depicted as a literal piece of shit and garbage, and turned them into a sexy bee lava lamp wolf fox lady. Viv looked at Mammon, Deadly Sin of Greed, who's usually depicted as a wolf, and decided, you know what? Even though I have about five billion wolf-like characters in my stories, let's make Mammon a giant clown bird instead. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, I wasn't surprised when Lucifer rolled up looking like a frat-rich Pillsbury Doughboy. Hell itself is depicted in a ton of different ways. The Christian Bible to Dante's Inferno, there's a lot of different iterations on what hell looks like, and clearly Hasbin is doing its own thing. That's fine. It didn't surprise me. However, even though it's clearly trying to do its own thing, it also doesn't really seem to know what to actually do with itself. Episode 1 explains that Lucifer was cast out of heaven basically because he was too artsy. Heaven cast Lucifer and his love into the dark pit he had created. Okay. So then, why isn't Adam kicked out? Adam openly lavishes in his enjoyment of killing sinners in hell during the executions. And we see that being cast out of heaven is a thing. Sarah mentions it to Emily. So why is Adam still sticking around when he's obviously a dick and no one likes him? While we're on Adam, let's talk about heaven. Clearly, Vivian hasn't really thought about the heaven aspect of her story before. Hell has been fleshed out long before now, thanks to hell of a 
boss. I got comments on my prior reviews talking about the different beings in hell, the hierarchies, the different sections of hell and whatever. There's a lot of thought and lore put into it, and you can tell, but it also makes it easy to tell that heaven hasn't been fleshed out at all. We barely get to see it, but even then, there's nothing here that actually tells me about how this is any better or worse than hell. The only thing I can think of is like, maybe heaven doesn't have money? I was kind of surprised when the characters in has been started to talk about money because I figured it wouldn't be something worth having after death. But then, I can't think of anything more hellish than still needing to pay rent, so maybe everything's just free in heaven. Though Adam does mention, like, heaven dollars or something, I don't know. Whoever brings me Vaggie's head gets... I don't know, a million heaven bucks. How about that? Huh? Other than aesthetically, heaven doesn't look that different from hell to me. Yeah, everyone's smiling and dancing, and according to St. Peter, Everyone is hot. But like, we also have lots of singing and dancing in hell. And if you ask the internet, I can guarantee you plenty of people think all of the hell folks are also super hot. Look, that girl is even a spider, just like Angel. And when Serpentris ascended, he was still a snake. How is heaven different from hell? Yeah, people in hell are rude. Hi, mister! Go fuck yourself! But you know who's also fucking rude? Adam! Suck it, bitches! You better save the date, cunts. During the trial, Adam drops like a million swears and no one bats an eye. Is everything okay, Adam? Give me a fucking minute, okay? And let's fucking see it, bruh. I don't have hard days. It's fucking heaven, bitch. But then Charlie says fuck once and everyone's like, lay gasp, how could she? Fuck yes! <laughs> Those naughty hellions and their swearing. What? <laughs> Speaking of the trial, I do really like the plot point where they realize that even the angels in heaven don't know what qualifies a person from getting into heaven or not. None of you know what gets someone into heaven? This is actually really interesting. The idea the angels have taken this all for granted for so long that they don't even realize there's a problem to begin with. Suddenly, it's being called into question if some people are being sent to hell even if they don't really belong there. What system is currently in place? Who put it there and why? This totally caught my interest. This is actually a super intriguing concept, especially now that we've seen that sinners can be redeemed. How exactly did this happen? What will the Seraphims do with this information? If Serpentius made it to heaven, does that mean Adam could have made it to hell after he died? This is so interesting. This is the reason I liked watching the show. And this is also why I think it was such a big detriment to the story that they changed the ideas around how the execution worked. Like I mentioned, in the pilot, the executions were happening because hell was overrun with sinners. But in the show proper, they're doing it as a show of power, and that is so lame to me. The idea that hell is overpopulated because the qualifications for making it into heaven are unknown and perhaps too unobtainable compared to normal standards of modern day, that is so interesting. The idea that hell is overpopulated not because there are so many people who are bad, but because the people who made the rules never updated them? That is interesting, and the show just threw it away. <laughs> the new way they go about executions really undermines the interesting part about what they're doing here with heaven and hell, because the executions is just a thing they're doing basically for fun. Adam even says so. Extermination is so it feels like Charlie's endeavor is kind of pointless. Even if she can figure out how to redeem all the sinners in hell, they're still gonna go down and kill them, presumably, because it's not an overpopulation issue. There's no quantifiable end goal now. It's not, oh, if I can save half of the people in hell, they won't need to execute them anymore. Now it's just, I could redeem all the people I want, but they're gonna be coming down and killing them anyways. It's the change that is the biggest difference for the plot, and is also the thing that I don't understand the most. <laughs> I don't understand why they changed this aspect, because it was already so interesting and works so well with what they have going on with the plot, and I don't know why they changed it. I saw a lot of people were very nonplussed with the whole heaven is just as bad as hell gimmick for the show, but I actually think they've 
they've been able to go in a super cool direction with it. Especially with Charlie and Emily being pillars of trying to change the system. The idea that these younger players, who aren't in total control yet, so they haven't turned complacent with their high standing positions yet. People who do actually see that the current systems are flawed and are trying to make things right, and actually agreeing with each other, despite technically being on opposing viewpoints of this conundrum. It's all pretty dang cool. Introducing Emily was hands down the best decision, I'd say. It took the admittedly typical concept of heaven is also bad and gave it a much more humanizing twist to it. I really hope this gets explored way more in season two. If they're going to be doing their own takes on hell and its lore and the demons and everything, I'd love to see heaven get explored like this too. It would not only help flesh out the world more, but also better define everything that our has-been heroes are trying to achieve. Laugh all you want. I'll be turning heads tomorrow night. In general, I don't hate Hasbin Hotel's designs. Some of them are pretty cool, actually. They stand out, they're instantly recognizable. There's no way you can get two characters mixed up. I understand why a lot of people really adore these designs. Personally, though, I feel like the characters in the show tip over into being over-designed. They're all very, very busy. Husk being the character whose design I struggle with the most, he's just got an awful lot going on. Between the cat thing, and then there's the wings, the tail, all of the different stripes with the different colors, there's the spots, the eyebrows, the heart-shaped spots. Visually, I just have a hard time really reading him when he's on screen. And for Husk, and for a lot of characters, I think just simplifying some of these extra elements would have really helped to elevate them. Feel less busy so my eyes don't get stuck doing circles as I get lost on screen. Like, let's look at Angel Dust. Arguably, one of their more reserved designs for a character. Also, one of the ones who changed the least between the pilot design and his official show design. Let's take away all of his colors and patterns. Can you remember what he's supposed to look like? Well, I'm just going to cut to black for a second. And now I'm going to cut back with Angel, now he has all of his colors back. Except I've done something wrong, actually. In fact, there's quite a few mistakes here now. Can you find them all? Can you remember what he looks like enough to recognize what's wrong here? Well first, his lower pair of arms don't have pink gloves on. Also, I've swapped his eye colors and his bow tie colors. Maybe you noticed, but I didn't add his lower pink spots below his eyes. And that's it, right? All those changes, and were you able to recognize any of them? Well, if you did, I hope you also noticed that I didn't add the pale pink spots on his hair. If I took most any other character from an animated medium and I did the same trick, I think you'd be able to catch all the differences a lot easier, even for something that has a much more busy design. And remember, I said Angel was one of their more reserved characters. Can you see what's wrong with Alistair here? How about, do you see what's wrong with Velvet here? There's so many extra bits and bops with these characters that they tend to feel like white noise to my eyes, especially when every single character is on screen and it's very overwhelming. And it's probably one of the reasons it took so long for the show to get made. Yeah, when I look at these characters and I think about the animators having to constantly go back and double check every single stripe and spot and gold tooth and four different colors for their eyes and all of the everything, no wonder it took them five years to finish animating the show. I don't think anyone with an actual degree or understanding of character design would approve of these designs for a show, but the problem was that the fans got super attached to them, long before the pilot even came out. Like I said, Viv was doing speed paints and stuff. So not only Viv herself, but all of her fans became hyper attached to these looks and clearly got upset when things started to change. Changing a character's design is pretty par for the course when designing a cartoon. It's actually one of my favorite things to look back at how much a design can change during the developmental process of a show's pre-production. Figuring out what colors read best on screen, what helps pop against the environments, what's a bit more recognizable or easier to animate. Bringing up Steven Universe's pilot again, it's obvious how much these characters and even the art style for the show changed during its production. I would have loved to see the show proper look like this. I've made a whole video talking about it, but that's just how production works. That's how dealing with silhouettes and color schemes and animation works. But it got skipped over with Hasbin because the fans 
Hans and Viv were too married to these original ideas. When we first started to see images revealing the characters' redesigns for the show proper, the internet threw a fit over it. Charlie was the first character we saw, and she is one of the few who has the most obvious changes to her outfit. Personally, I think Charlie is one of the best designed characters here. I also really like the pilot's design, but the full pantsuit type of style and her tied back hair helps to represent her sort of high-strung, go get em Leslie Nope from Parks and Rec style personality she has. Also, with her hair tied up, it's a lot more noticeable when she goes full demon mode, because it's easier to notice her hair starting to billow around. This was a super minor change, but there was a very vocal crowd who hated the fact this design was changed at all. Vaggy even more so, because her changes are a lot more different. Personally, I think this is a huge improvement. Her haircut reads much more like moth wings now. Incorporating reds and blacks into her design really helped to make her match Charlie and the rest of the team more. We got rid of the stupid X boobs. So goofy looking. <laughs> but people were upset. Hell, I distinctly remember people throwing a huge fit when Alistair got redesigned. How did he get redesigned? Oh, well, if you look closely, the collar on his jacket is white now instead of black. I know. How could they change him so much? It's like he's a total stranger now. While we're on Alistair, let's talk about something else I don't like about the style of the show. All of the suits. Everyone wears a suit and bow tie. Alistair, Serpentius, Angel Dust, Charlie, Vox, Lucifer. It's super boring to me. They all feel so samey and it screams of either laziness or a lack of creativity. I've heard Viv came up with the designs when she was in middle school and you can tell. <laughs> when I was in middle school, I also drew everyone wearing the same outfit over and over again. That's why there's so many bips and bops and stripes and spots and stuff. Because in an attempt to convince yourself you're not drawing the same outfit a million times, you've added a ton of extra things to make it feel like their designs are different at a glance. For Alistair and Vox, I get it. There's supposed to be equals and opposites for each other. But all these other characters... Come on. Everything else about these characters are so wild and creative. Why are their outfits so boring by comparison? Also, with Alistair, I just cannot see his horns most of the time. They are too dark, regularly getting lost in his own hair or in the background. Another thing I've noticed about this is the sameness of body types and face shapes. Almost every character is a super skinny stick figure. I mentioned silhouettes before with Steven Universe. If I draw the crystal gems without any of their features, you'd still probably be able to guess which character is which. If I did that with Hasbun Hotel, there'd be no way. Except for Nifty, because she's so short. It makes it feel like your characters have no identity or individuality from each other in the world of shape language. Then there's their faces. So there's a moment when an egg boy sneaks into the Overlord's meeting and he sees this lady, Rosie, and she smiles at him and it scares him. But what was it that scared him? She doesn't look threatening or like she's mad or anything. She just smiled. So I'm left to assume he was scared by her large, sharp teeth. But it makes no sense because Alistair also has the same large smile and sharp teeth. And so does Serpentius, and Angel Dust, and Vox, and Valentino, and Nifty, and Husk, and Katie Killjoy, and a ton of other characters. It makes no sense why he would be scared by Rosie's smile here, when seemingly 80% of Hell all have the same exact smile. Fuck, if anything, she looks more pleasant than most other characters. She didn't even do that thing where her eyes eyes are angry, but she's smiling. I think that expression is so goofy looking and Hasbin does it nonstop. <laughs> so I see why people do like it. And I do like a good amount of the designs a lot. Nifty is top tier with her colors and style. She has a great silhouette. Basically every single complaint I've had, Nifty succeeds with flying colors. Enough spots and accents to make her stand out, but she never feels like she's too much. Carmilla is also really great. 
great, her shape language is perfect, and her accessories are unique to her and really memorable. I went back to look at her in the pilot, and this design is a huge improvement. I liked the extra long fingers the pilot style had, but the hair being styled up like huge horns is such a great design element. Honestly, I really hated it when she put her hair down to fight Faggy, because when it's up like horns, it's just so much more noticeable and cool. Speaking of being really different from their pilot looks, Velvet used to look awful. Ugh, the frizzy pigtails, the huge puffy shoulders. Let's not kid ourselves. This? Fucking hideous. Like Baby's first attempt at doing a grim dark spin on Alice in Wonderland. Hell, I've read a manga called Alice in Murderland, and this design wishes it could be that level of middle school edge. Her new design reads so much better. Especially since her gimmick is fashion, I'd expect the fashionista to not look like she's wearing a cheap spirit Halloween costume. The pink with the white swirl is really nice, and reads really well no matter what style her hair is currently in. And the pinstripe style pants does a great job to bring your eye back around to the important part, her face. Unless it's an intentional element for the character, the design should always help bring your eye to the character's face. That's where their personality exists. That's where we see them emote. That's what helps make them feel like more than just a drawing, but like a real person. And all of Velvet's look do a great job directing your eye back to her face where it belongs. Busy designs like Alistair, where we have a million tiny stripes and things going a bunch of different directions, regularly draw my eye away from his face. Long story short, there are really great designs. Nifty, Carmilla, Velvet, I mentioned Vaggy and Charlie already too, but overall I think it's a bit too over ambitious with its colors and accessories, but not ambitious enough with its actual clothing styles and silhouettes, especially its male characters for some reason. Like, did you notice all of the girls got really drastic changes to their designs, but the boys stayed almost exactly the same? I bet it's because the show is like tailor-made to pump out Tumblr sexy men designs. Yeah, you might like Alistair, but how does it feel knowing he'll never be as good as Sans Undertale? <laughs> fucking dick. It's time to play the music! There are two songs per episode, which is very ambitious. Regardless of my opinions of the songs, or even the rest of the show, I do have to give props to the team for putting together a full 16 track set list for this season. It's not easy to do, so well done. I will say though, I don't think every episode needed two songs. I think certain episodes would have done better with one bigger, longer song, and some episodes episodes could have benefited from more than just two songs. And some episodes, I think, could have had the two songs be back to back with each other. It feels like they structured the episode's plot beats around the two song placements in the two halves of the episode. And I wonder if that restricted them a little bit. I hope with season two they play around with their song amounts and episode placements a little bit more. So now to talk about the songs themselves, there's only one good way to do this. I'm going to rank all 16 songs from worst to best. It's just so goofy for the show to expect me to care about Carmilla this much this early on. I met this character like three minutes ago. I don't care about her wailing about protecting her daughters. Also, as a personal thing, I really hate it when I can really clearly hear the breathing between lines in a song. Being attacked. Vaggie's singing voice is very noticeably higher pitched than her normal speaking voice, and it's a little weird. All right, everyone, let's make a fucking commercial. It's probably because Stephanie Beatriz naturally sings in a higher register. This is rather similar to her performance as Mirabelle in Encanto, but also she was giving Mirabelle a higher, more nasally pitched speaking voice in Encanto too, so it wasn't too different from each other. Just tell me what it is. There's nothing to tell. You're obviously worried about something. I'm waiting on a miracle. 
similarly with Carmilla, I think it's just a little silly to have Vaggy singing this big song about wanting to protect and help Charlie. I like the idea in theory, but the actual episode didn't do a good enough job setting up the idea that there was anything for Vaggy to be worried about. At least the visuals with Vaggy are fun. She runs around, climbs the hotel, jumps to the radio tower. It's cool, but Carmilla's half is so boring. It's just a close-up on her dumb face, and all I ever look at are her goofy earrings that hang off of her hair because she doesn't actually have ears. Such a boring use of your visual medium for the song. Overall, this should have just been a Vaggy song. Cut out Carmilla and establish Vaggy's plot better. I love you. This song is so short that I actually wasn't even sure it counted as one of the episode's songs. I really like the visuals for this one, and I like the idea of Charlie and Vaggy having one last moment to reassure each other before the battle against heaven, but like, why did they reprise the song Charlie sang with her dad? I know the gist of the song doesn't specify familial love or romantic love, but like, I don't know. <laughs> As I was watching the scene, I was just suddenly reminded of Charlie and her dad jumping around hugging each other. Why not reprise whatever it takes? The only other song Vaggy had sang and was specifically about her wanting to support Charlie. Whatever. Welcome to heaven. This one's just too short for what I wish it was. I would have liked to see more of heaven here. The song feels like it's trying to parallel a happy day in hell, but we just don't get as much depth or details about what heaven has here. Basically, I just wish it was longer. This was our one chance to actually see what all of heaven has that makes it great. And it's mostly just people sitting around drinking coffee and shots of the sky. What, is heaven a hallway? Show me all the cool stuff about this place, come on. It starts with sorry. Charlie has a beautiful singing voice. Hands down, her amazing singing is what elevates this song above the others. But sorry is where it starts. But, um, S -S Serpentius doesn't. <laughs> Forgive a dirt bag like me. So I appreciate that he's staying in character with this song. Like I was saying with Vaggy earlier, when their singing voices is noticeably different from their speaking voices, it can be distracting, but hot damn. <laughs> I was listening to the soundtrack as I was walking to the store and Serpentius just totally took me out of it. Also, it's too short and quick for being the thing that convinces me Serpentius actually wants to be redeemed now. We could have cut this one, honestly. <laughs> You're like the child that I wish that uh, what? The animation for the song, and really the whole episode it comes from, is a little too fast paced for me. I tend to feel a little nauseous when I watch it because of how many things are moving and how quickly it's all paced. But ignoring that, I can't deny that the animation for the song is really above and beyond. A lot of really fun details and actions, I love how the color changes depending on which character is singing. Also, as a general, the songs tend to have very impressive rhymes, but this song especially is one of the ones that really impressed me. I'm your guy, your day to day, your chum, your steadfast hotelier. Too bad Mimsy shows up and totally ruins the ending of the song though. Though I kind of feel unsteady, now I need to be ready for this. It's fine. Any song that heavily features Erica Henningsen singing is going to be good based solely on the fact that her voice is magical, but the song is just a bit too long for me and the visuals are a tad boring. Also, I know I just said that most of the songs have really impressive rhymes, but this one song is the one that has like the worst rhyme in the whole show. Best princess of hell, like her daddy, she is badly powerful. Ew, terrible rhyme. This is the last song on this ranking though that would count as I don't want to listen to the song in my free time. The rest of them I would totally listen to again. Oh. Tell me that you didn't know. Like I already said, Charlie's singing voice is fantastic, and here Emily's singing voice matches her perfectly. That's why the absolute best and most memorable part is at the very end of the song when they duet with each other. Also, the lyrics of them grilling heaven for being hypocrites really hits hard. If hell is forever, then heaven must be alive. However, I feel like the rest of the song is kind of all over the place. We bounce between like three different rhymes and rhythms. Don't you care? I wonder if this was
was actually supposed to be two different songs, but they got stitched together into one bigger one. Personally, I would have preferred if we just axed Welcome to Heaven, since it barely even showed us heaven at all, and expanded this song way more. Maybe making two songs being sung back to back even? It's very ambitious, and the visuals really elevate the whole thing above and beyond, but I think it needed to just be a bit more refined. More than anything. This song is sweet. It's a really great way to show the mending relationship between Charlie and Lucifer. I like how we get both very grounded, real visuals of them just talking directly to each other, but we also get the big, grand visuals of them flying around together, and even a sad glimpse of back when Charlie was just a little girl. It's sweet. I just prefer the other songs a little bit more. This is a subjective list of my dumb opinions, after all. I am completely neutral about the song. I have no outstanding opinions either way. It's fine. <laughs> I'm gonna make you wish that you Stayed God. I really like how this song mirrors itself, starting really slow as Vox starts things off. Say hello to a new status quo. Then it ramps up to being a lot faster as Vox talks shit. He's a loser, a fossil, and I don't mean to sound hostile, but the demon is a coward. Then Alistair joins in and starts off really quickly with rebuttaling Vox, talking shit back to him. Uh -huh. Pursuing a lure, living between this bad and that is nothing work. And then slows things back down as Alistair ends the song. Make you wish that I'd stayed gone. I do like that. It's a really cool parallel with each other. Personally, though, I'm not a fan of Vox's singing in this one, especially during his faster segment, and the rhymes in this one aren't as clever as some of the other songs. Still, it is a really fun back and forth, and it had some really creative visuals, too. It's a happy day! Hell. It's fun. It sets the tone for the show and for Charlie's character really well. Unlike Welcome to Heaven, it actually does a great job showing us what hell is like, having a lot of fun with the characters and visuals of the locations, and Charlie's singing voice is just so damn good I can't get over it. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the sudden shift into like a jaunty verse randomly in the middle of the song. No, it just doesn't feel like it really fits the rest of the song. And the joke during this part isn't really very good either. But minor detail, the rest of it is fun. But you'll only stand a chance if you're out for love. I really like the visuals with this song. Mixing dance with battle is a cool way to jazz up Carmilla training Vaggy. Fast enough to match the pace of the song, but not too fast where it's hard to follow. It's also very catchy. It definitely got stuck in my head for a few days. It's a good, simple song. Hell is forever whether you like it or not. Some really great visuals with this one, really playing into the limitless potential of their animated medium for this song. Also, it's just a really catchy earworm. I will say, Charlie trying to interrupt Adam makes sense in the show, but I wish they cut her out of the official soundtrack, because Charlie regularly chirping into the song is awfully distracting when you're just listening to it. Until we kill him again. Okay, Just bye. try to chillax, babe. You're wasting your breath. <laughs> Other than that, great song. Sets up our villains really well. It's fun. It's catchy. It highlights Adam's personality without sacrificing his singing voice. Fun stuff. We can do this. We can build it. Best hotel that you've ever seen. This song was a great way to wrap up the end of the season. It was really great seeing everyone chiming in and working together, bringing back elements from Happy Day in Hell. Happy Day! It's really cute seeing Lucifer cheering up Charlie, and I love the visuals of everyone rebuilding the hotel together. Then there's Alistair's section. It's so ominous and intrigues me so much. I can't tell if he'll end up as the main villain in the end or not. And this section really sets the tone of his more sinister side for his character, especially contradicting to how he just pops into the middle of everyone, putting on the facade for them. It's really interesting and cool. The only downside, let's be real, the V's did not deserve a verse. You guys can get a part in the final song when you actually freaking do something worthwhile in the season. Sit your asses back down. Very cute, appropriately grandiose for being the finale. Well done. Not that I'll act respectless. Well, it's cause no one could respect this. 
man, it annoys me because I think a lot of the lyrics in the song is clunky. Then Velvet has a whole mini breakdown about who she is as a character, interrupting the point of the song, which was to accuse Carmilla of killing the angel, and she does it with the goofiest ass woo, and the animation is so stupid looking. Nothing less than what I play is woo! Mm. But hot damn, this is one of the catchiest songs I've ever fucking heard. I honestly wish it was a lot longer because I really like it. I would have loved to see a bigger back and forth between Carmilla and Velvet here. And I am so damn impressed that they came up with so many lyrics to rhyme with the word respectless. One thing I'm starting to suspect is you know why this angel's headless. I just can't stop listening to it. It's so catchy. Mm. Baby, a loser, goddamn baby. Keith David is such a treasure, and he does a phenomenal job with this song. Not to knock Blake Roman as Angel Dust either. The two sound great together when they do it. I really like the way the song approaches Husk talking to Angel about his problems. Because when you're hurting like Angel is, having someone tell you everything will be okay is never really helpful. So having Husk turn it on its head and instead talk about how they've both been fucked over by the people they sold their souls to not only gives them something in common so they can better relate with each other, but also makes the premise of the song more interesting than the usual cheer up kind of songs. So then when the song does turn towards the lyrics that are meant to make Angel feel better, it feels a lot more natural and hits a lot harder. Like how Angel doesn't actually start singing until after Husk validates who Angel already is. It's okay to Coked up dick sucking hoe? Maybe that's fine by me. I think my favorite lyric is at the very end of the song. Husk drops this absolute bombshell of inspiration. It's time to lose yourself, loathing, excuse yourself, let open, baby. It's so sweet. The visuals for the song is also a 10 out of 10. They really play around with doing something stylish and cool, and I absolutely love it. Not only the big flashy neon moments, but also just seeing the characters dancing together is a treat. I love this song so damn much. I've been listening to it nonstop since episode four came out. In fact, I theorize that they dropped the first four episodes all at once because they knew this song was going to be the big hit for the show. It's smart, it's fun, it's sweet, and I love it. At least I know I'm not alone. You're a loser just, just like me. However, while we're on the topic of Angel Dust and his story, I think it's time to tackle one of the more important elements of the show. I didn't ask to be this way. I didn't ask for Charlie to save me. So, an important trigger warning for this section. Angel Dust's story heavily focuses on themes of sexual abuse. If you're not comfortable with hearing about this topic, go ahead and skip to this timestamp or use the chapters option in the timeline of this video and in the description. So if you're sticking around, here we go. Angel Dust's plotline heavily focuses on his abusive relationship with Valentino. It tackled topics of rape, abuse, addiction, Addiction, destructive tendencies, and other topics in that vein. Importantly, I do not think I have any authority to really say if this topic was handled well or not. I think the most important thing in this scenario is to listen to the people who were actual victims of sexual abuse. I've seen mixed reactions from various people talking about how this relates to their experiences with this topic. Some people really like Angel Dust's portrayal here. I've seen them say it feels like this accurately portrays the roller coaster of being stuck in a relationship like this. Valentino's calls to Angel swapping from being overly sweet to threatening. The way Valentino tries to keep Angel from other people being upset when he moved into the hotel. The way Angel did everything he could to get Charlie away from Val, even when it meant he had to yell at her to get her to go away. Showing how, even though Angel knows it's a bad relationship and he's not happy, there are those moments where he keeps coming back. He keeps getting stuck in Val's lies and swept up in the party of it all. How it's not that easy to just walk away. But I've also seen people saying the opposite is true, and they hate how Angel Dust is portrayed here. They say it feels like the show is glamorizing or fetishizing rape, 
having Angel Dust sing a boppy pop song while dancing around to cute synchronized choreography undermines the actual idea of how bad this experience is. I've seen people say Loser Baby feels more like it's mocking Angel Dust, undermining and insulting his ordeal. Like I said, I have no authority to speak on this matter, and 100%, the only people who do have any authority have every single right to feel the way they do. If they think it's great, then they are valid in feeling that way. If they think it's ass, they are also valid in feeling that way. What they've had to go through is horrible. And if you're one of the people who's gone through something like this, I just want to say I am very sorry and I truly hope with all of my heart that you are in a better place with people who really love you and support you. So what can I say about Angel Dust? Well, I think maybe Viv bit off more than she can chew with this storyline. Clearly, this is a very sensitive topic and perhaps she wasn't the best person to try and tackle it. Maybe, just maybe, the cartoon about the sexy pinstripe spider monster wasn't the best place to try and tackle as heavy a topic as sexual abuse. I will say, the whole thing comes across as rather tropey to me. I mean, fucking look at Valentino's design. The fur collar, the heart-shaped glasses, the gold tooth. He looks like a 50-year-old white woman's idea of what a stereotypical pimp would look like. Come on. They also really shoot themselves in the foot by having other moments of the show where sexual abuse or implied rape is a punchline for a joke. You can't have a story about a character's trauma dealing with non-consensual sexual relationship abuse and then have a joke about a character being dragged off into a sex den against his will. Moments like this undermine the message you're trying to tell. It can't live as both a serious dramatic issue that you want the audience to take seriously, and also as a joke that you want the audience to laugh at within your show. Maybe they shouldn't have even tried to touch on this topic. I don't know. Honestly, I don't really know what to say about this issue moving forward with season two. There's going to be no good transition out of this section of the video, so I'm just gonna end it here. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. I already mentioned it, but two of my biggest critiques with the original Has Been Hotel pilot was with the animation and the sound effects. The animation would frantically cut from angle to angle way too quickly, and the characters would squirm around with every single new syllable they said, making the whole thing overwhelming and hard to watch, honestly. On top of that, the sound effects were a little too goofy. <laughs> <laughs> about what some tux wearing demon princess wants to advertise. So many bloinks, sproings, bleeps, and blops, it made it sound like a cartoon aimed for very little children and was pretty distracting. And I cannot express how happy I am that the show proper fixed these issues with flying colors. The animation is impressive, smooth and expressive without feeling like it's too much. A few moments can feel a bit frantic, like Velvet Song in episode 3, and for some reason episode 5 in its entirety feels a little too busy with the speed of the characters, but overall the animation is fantastic. It's so refreshing getting more and more animated shows aimed for mature audiences that aren't ugly as fuck. Ugly exaggerated character designs meant to feel like insulting caricatures, with incredibly simplistic animation styles meant to pump out a million episodes as cheaply and quickly as possible. I cannot express it enough. The animators did an absolutely beautiful, amazing job with this whole show. I sure do hope they got paid fair wages for all of this quality effort. <laughs> the sound effects are also toned down a lot more. Now every little movement doesn't come accompanied with a Looney Tunes catalog. There was a few noticeable sound effects that felt like they were a bit much. Very problem you and your little friends are- And what do you think your chances will be then? You're out of time. Your face. 
Try it, bitch. But those little things are so forgivable. I really hope this inspires other people to tell mature animated stories with as expressive and fun styles as this. Aggie, did you see the ice cream shop? They had sprinkles made of rainbows! I mentioned it at the very beginning that the original cast all got replaced. From what I've seen, there doesn't seem to be too much bad blood between them and Viv for this decision, but I will admit I wasn't too surprised when this happened. It sucks, but when people get a budget for something like this, they usually will jump at the chance to sign on big famous names for their show. Most characters sound pretty similar to their pilot counterparts, to the point where I honestly had a hard time hearing the differences between pilot Alistair and show Alistair. Alistair, pleasure to be meeting you, sweetheart. Quite a pleasure. Alistair, pleasure to be meeting you, sir. Quite a pleasure. Maybe it's the radio effect on their voices, but they seem nearly one-to-one -to, -one to me. I will say, everyone does pretty fantastic jobs. Blake Roman as Angel Dust had a lot of really complex, emotionally charged scenes to tackle, and he absolutely nailed it with flying colors. You actually want to help me? Get the fuck out of here! Right now! Alex Brightman, who you might recognize as Beetlejuice in the stage play, really impressed me with his performance, mostly because he's both Adam and Serpentius. Oops, almost out of time. Guess we should get into it. But they say insane shit all the time. How was I supposed to know this one was true? It's a really great range he has. I hope he does a lot more voice acting because he's really good at it. Patina Miller as Sarah and Shoba Narian as Emily also really impressed me. They're only in the one episode, but their characters had to do a lot of emotional range, and they really nailed it. I never would have agreed to your yearly activities if I thought it would bring trouble to our doorstep. Extermination of human souls. Demon or not, there is no reason to be doing this. Out of everyone in the pilot, there's only three characters whose voices in the show proper are very noticeably different. First and least importantly is Katie Killjoy. She is a minor character in the long run, now being voiced by Brandon Rogers. And I will admit, I was pretty startled at just how different her voice is here compared to the pilot. I'd say it's a pleasure to meet you, but that would be a lie. You can put that away. I don't touch the gays. I've just received word from the Heaven Embassy that the next extermination is happening sooner than ever before. Brendan's voice is not bad by any means. It was just very surprising to me. Next is Husk, and I'll be honest, Keith David is so damn perfect for this role. Don't you Husker me, you son of a bitch. I was about to win the whole damn pot! You actually think I'd be cleaning bottles and listening to you fucks bitch and moan all the time if he wasn't forcing me? Husk was also the only character in the pilot whose voice I wasn't really that impressed with. You could tell the voice actor was straining to make their voice sound deeper and scratchier, where Keith David's voice voice is just naturally a lot deeper and smokier. Also, can we just talk about how freaking precious he is? Have you seen his posts on Twitter? He's just so cool and happy to be voicing Husk. He's a treasure. Oh my god, it's so sweet and he's so cool. <laughs> Last is Vaggy, the only character whose new voice I think is actually noticeably worse than their original pilot voice. Your credibility? What about the hotels? Your little stunt? made us look like a fucking joke. Because it won't be so entertaining to watch over an empty hotel, will it, shit ass? Stephanie Beatriz is clearly doing something similar to her character Rosa from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I've only had Arlo for a day and a half, but if anything happened to him, I would kill everyone in this room and then myself. Time everyone needs to catch him, okay? Unless you want me to hurt you. It's technically fine, but more often than not, I think she sounds a little too blasé. She sounds bored or directionless. There's just not a lot of emotion in her performance. We have a plan, but it includes defending ourselves against the angels. She's a good actress, and she's been a good voice actress before too. So I really do wonder if there was just a problem with directing her for her lines. I don't know. It's not bad. It's just noticeable. Fortunately though, the whole rest of the cast really impresses me. In fact, we get a lot of really great performances for characters who don't play very major roles this season. The failed angel. It was by thy hand, was it not? Of course I do! Fuck you! Now shoo! Angel is living with Lucifer's daughter now? She's much too young for you! Oh, I'm just kidding! I know you're an ace in the hole! A what now? Oh look! The 
the drunk sobered up long enough to judge us. And it makes me hope we get to see them a lot more moving into season two because they've done so great here and I would love to see a lot more from them. Everyone, fantastic job. Have you ever noticed salt shakers? And I mean, where does it all go? Huh? You know what I mean? So everything I've said so far has, for the most part, been pretty subjective, but comedy is definitely one of the most subjective mediums there is. Sometimes you think something's funny, sometimes you don't. There's a lot of factors that go into it and it's kind of hard to talk about because once you try to explain a joke, it stops being funny. So I will not be surprised if you disagree with me here. Personally, I didn't find the show all that funny. I could tell they were saying jokes and I could tell it's meant to be comedic and lighthearted at times, but I don't know, most jokes just didn't land. Not to say it was entirely absent of comedy. Serpentress's antics with Cherry Bomb were pretty good. There was some funny faces here or there, but I actually often felt like they weren't pushing it with their expressions to really hit home with their comedy. I guess it's good they always stayed on model, but I personally find it funnier when you really stretch an expression for the sake of comedic purposes. Hands down, the funniest character was Lucifer? I don't know, maybe it was the actor's delivery, but his jokes landed better than anyone else's, and I really love them. My daughter wants to see me! Take that! Depression. You mess with my daughter, and now I am going to fuck you! It's fuck you up, Dad. Wait, what did I say? I think the biggest flop in terms of the show's comedy is its over-reliance on swearing. I'm sure we've all seen the memes about how Vivzy Pops shows use an insane amount of swears. Now, obviously, I don't care about swearing. I've been swearing throughout this whole video. I'm not some pearl-clutching boomer who's offended by the naughty swear words. Ew. <laughs> but I do think there's three main problems with the way Vivzy Pop over-relies on swears as the punchlines for her jokes. First, the more you repeat a joke, the less funny it gets. When the punchline of a joke is just someone saying fuck or dick or whatever, eventually you get used to the word and the funny impact of what it means start to lose its luster. And a lot of the jokes in Has Been Hotel basically just relies on you thinking tee hee hee swear words are funny. Fuck you, mediocre! Fuck you, you old bitch! <laughs> Second, when it starts to become noticeable, it also starts to become distracting. Once you start thinking about how everyone is saying swears as their jokes, you start to predict it, and it actually takes you out of the show, and it ruins your immersion, and makes the jokes near impossible to land that way. You're... Fuck you, you red piece of fuck! Too much fucking red fuck! Shut up! Third, I think they're just not putting the swears in the right places for their sentences. A lot of the time, it feels like the voice actor is going out of their way to include a random swear in the middle of their lines, which feels like it's probably written into the script this way. Usually, when people swear casually, it's more off the cuff. Lots of times, people use swears as a replacement for uh or um. So here, it feels a lot more forced hearing how their swearing is scripted, making it feel less like, oh, the show has characters who swear, and more like, did you catch all that swearing? This is an adult show with swears. We're putting a lot of emphasis so you know how adult we are. And it becomes very distracting. You're still pissed, he almost beat you that time. Uh, fuck you. The other thing about all the swearing is that it feels like Viv is really uncreative. Like, there's some amazingly funny insults from various movies and TV shows that don't require swearing. Shut your mouth, you mediocre clarinet player. Mediocre? You know what's a really funny zinger that I can remember right off the top of my head? I can still fight! Okay, three on three plus soccer. <laughs> That's a great insult. It's really funny and super memorable thanks to how creative Toph is. Her insult is really specific to who Sokka is as a character. None of the insults in Has Been Hotel really stood out to me. They weren't particularly funny or memorable, and it makes every character's dialogue kind of sound the same as each other. Definitely, I think they could be a lot more creative with their comedy for the show. As it is, it feels very safe. They could really be pushed pushing the limits a lot more with the show moving forward. It's a happy day in hell. 
I feel like this review is kind of all over the place. And honestly, I feel like Has Been Hotel itself is kind of all over the place too. I think it's impossible to blanketly say that it's all bad or that it's all good. I don't think there's any one thing that's done entirely poorly or done entirely perfectly. It's unique. I'll give it that. <laughs> in general, I think it's hard to judge a show based on its first season. It tends to always have the most obvious growing pains here. And I hope with season two, a lot of the issues we see here might be addressed or improved on. Maybe they'll get more episodes so they can stretch things out a bit more rather than working at a breakneck pace. Or maybe Vivzy Pop will figure out how to edit down her story to fit with her shorter runtime better. It's weird knowing that season two is already underway. It was announced before the first season even started to air. Like I've said multiple times, the premise really intrigues me. That's the biggest thing keeping me invested in the show. The actual cast of The Has Been Hotel. The real dilemma Charlie is trying to tackle of figuring out how to redeem sinners so they make it into heaven. But I'm worried the show might distract itself with all of these side characters and their subplots. I'll be honest, right now I find Vox painfully uninteresting. There's apparently been some rumors floating around that Vox will be the main antagonist of season two, and honestly that notion doesn't interest me very much. The battle about morality and the logistics and politics of heaven and hell is so much more interesting than just a random dude who has money and power. Yawn. He has some interesting setup, but I don't know. I'm not looking forward to him being the main antagonist of season two. They'll have to do a lot to really impress me with this one. <laughs> now that's good television! I hope they play around with their music more in season two as well. Playing around with even more styles would be cool. Hopefully we get more songs from our main cast. It's criminal that Husk only sang one song all season, Carmilla got freaking two, but Husk only got one, and Nifty didn't get any. Criminal. Absolutely criminal. <laughs> the ultimate bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of loose threads laying around that they could play with moving into season two, but I hope at the end of the day, they remember to keep the focus on our actual hotel heroes. They are the most interesting, most entertaining parts of the show, and I really want to see them a lot more. I want them to talk to each other more. I hope we tackle their personal problems and relationships more. It's easy to get lost in exploring all of your side characters too, but remember, these folks are the ones that are really holding the show up on their shoulders. All right, let's give it up for not dying. Love not dying. They've confirmed it won't take as long for season two to come out as it did for season one compared to when the pilot aired, which honestly, it would have been harder to take longer than the five years we had to wait for that. <laughs> did season one of Has Been Hotel live up to all the hype? Was the wait worth it? Maybe not. <laughs> But that doesn't mean it doesn't still have potential. When you have five to ten years worth of hype, I think it's impossible to live up to all of those expectations. The cast is great, and the animators did absolutely amazingly. If anyone deserves a ton of love and attention and appreciation for their efforts, it's them. They all poured a lot of hard work into their performances and animation efforts, and it really shows. I'm nervous, but excited to see what they've got cooking up for us for season two. Hopefully, it doesn't take too long. <laughs> God, you are four of the ugliest fucking kids I've ever had the misfortune of laying my eyes on. I am function for funny <laughs> and also annoying. <laughs> Come on, boys. Won't you shake a poor sinner's hand? You say, if God can leave you, what is it? If, if the Lord can lead you to it, he can lead you to it. Take this, take this, take this, take this. <laughs> All right, that's good enough for today, Ted. We've got everything we need. Take this, take this, take this. <laughs> All right, I get it, fine. You're all without fathers, all right? I, I'm I, I, not. I love my dad. My dad's fucking awesome. You just saved me. I'm free. Shout out to my $10 patrons. You're all amazing. Andrew, Valhalla Knight, Chamomile, Classy Critic, Noah Perkins, Sunny Shy, Jake, Amber, Hype Man, Zero to Hero, Isaiah, Scaring Crows, Messiah Complex, Jacob, Ben Sketchbook, The Watcher, Omega Fighter, Trash, Wild Pilot, 
Josh, Gino, Twisty, Juan, Bunkin Duncan, and Alpha 99. I hope you liked this video. Big ol' long one talking about has been hotel. There's a lot going on in this show, and I'm sure your thoughts might will probably di be different than some of mine. So, any and all thoughts and opinions about the show, leave them in the comments. I would love to see them, especially if you made it all the way to the end of the video. I really appreciate it. Let me know what you think. Are you excited for season two? Are you not? Tell me your ranking for the songs as well. Like I told you mine, I would. That's the thing I'm most intrigued by. What was your favorite song? Any and all thoughts and opinions, leave them in the comments, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.